Welcome everybody to deep learning. So today we want to look into further common practices and in particular in this video we want to discuss architecture selection and hyperparameter optimization. Um, that is really the pinnacle of that where you uh, then not only learn uh, how to improve on that problem and on that but you also improve the way the machine improves and you also improve the way it improves the way it improves itself. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis which was all about that. Remember the test data is still in the vault. We are not touching it. However, we need to set our hyperparameters somehow. And you've already seen that there's enormous amount of hyperparameters. You have the architecture, number of layers, number of nodes per layer, activation functions. Then you have all the parameters in the optimization, the initialization, the loss function, the optimizers, like stochastic gradient descent, momentum, Adam, learning rate, decay, and batch size. And in regularization, you have different regularizers, L2, L1 loss, batch normalization, dropout, and so on. And you want to somehow figure out all the parameters for those different kinds of procedures. Now let's choose architecture and loss function. And the first step would be think about the problem and the data. How could features look like? What kind of spatial correlation do you expect? What data augmentation makes sense? How will the classes be distributed? What is important regarding the target application? Then you start with simple architectures and loss functions. And of course, you do your research. Try well-known models first and foremost. They are being published. There's so many papers out there. There is no need to do everything on yourself. So one day in the library can save hours and weeks and months of experimentation. Do the research. It will really save you time. And often they just don't publish a single paper, but in the very good papers, it's not just uh, the scientific results, but they also share source code, sometimes even data. Try to find those papers. This can help you a lot with your own experimentation. Also because I'm lazy, so, you know, kind of. <laughs> so then you may want to change, adapt this architecture that you found in literature. And if you change something, find good reasons why this is an appropriate change. There's quite a few papers out there that seem to introduce random changes into the architecture. And then later it turns out that the observations that they made were essentially random and they were just lucky or experimented enough on their own data in order to get the improvements. So far that hasn't really held up on other data sets. Typically there's also a reasonable argument why the specific change should give an improvement in performance. What is clear to me is that engineers and companies and labs and grad students will continue to tune architectures and explore all kinds of tweaks to make the current state of the art ever slightly better. Next, you want to do your hyperparameter search. So you remember learning rate, decay, regularization, dropout, and so on. These have to be tuned, but still the networks can take days or weeks to train. And you have to search for these hyperparameters and we recommend using a log scale. So for example, for EDA here, you go for 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. And you may want to consider grid search or random search. So in grid search, you would have equal distance steps. And if you look here at reference two, they have shown that the random search has really advantages over the grid search. First of all, it's easier to implement. And second, it has a better exploration of the parameters that have a strong influence on the result. So you may want to look into that and then adjust your strategy accordingly. So hyperparameters are highly interdependent. You may want to use a coarse to fine search therefore. So you optimize on a very coarse scale in the beginning and then make it finer and finer. You may only train the network for a few epochs and then bring all the hyperparameters in sensible ranges and then you can refine using random and grid search. A very common technique that can give you a little bit of boost of performance is ensembling. So this is also something that can really help you to get 
this additional little bit of performance that you still need. So far we have only considered a single classifier, but Ensembling has the idea by using many of those classifiers. If we assume n classifiers that are independent, performing a correct prediction will be at a probability of 1 minus p. Now the probability of seeing k errors is n choose k p to the power of k 1 minus p to the power of n minus k. And this is a binomial distribution. So the probability of a majority, meaning k greater than n over 2, to be wrong is the sum over n choose k p to the power of k 1 minus p to the power of n minus k. So we visualize this in the following plot. Here in this graph you can see that if I take more of those weak classifiers and we set for example their probability of being wrong to 0.42 and now we can compute this uh, binomial distribution and here you can see that if I choose 20 then I get a probability of approximately yeah, maybe 14 percent that the majority is wrong. If I choose 32 I get less than 10% probability that the majority is wrong and if I choose 70 in more than 95% of the cases the majority will be correct. So you see that this probability is monotonically decreasing for large n. So if n approaches infinity then the accuracy will go towards 1. It's over 9000! So the big problem here is, of course, the independence. Uh, so typically we have problems generating from the same data independent classifiers. So if we had, of course, enough data, then we could train many of those independent weak classifiers. I'm optimistic about what can happen just with more computation and more data. So how do we then implement this as a concept? So we somehow have to produce n independent classifiers or regressors and then we combine the predictions by majority or averaging. But how can we actually produce such components? Well you can choose different models. So the example here we have seen that we have a non-convex function and obviously they have different local minima so the different local minima would result in different models. And then we can combine them in an optimization process. Also what you can try is a cyclic learning rate where you then go up and down with the learning rate to escape certain local minima and this way you can then try to find different local minima and store them for ensembling later on. So therefore you could also take different model checkpoints uh, that you extract them at different points and then reuse them. You can then use a moving average of W over those models or you could even go this far and combine different methods. Uh, so we all still have the entire catalog of traditional machine learning. You could also train models using these procedures and then combine them with your new deep learning model. Typically this is an easy boost of performance if you need just a little bit more. So ensembling by the way was also the idea that finally help people to break the Netflix challenge. So the first two teams that uh, almost broke the Netflix challenge, they teamed up, trained an ensemble, and this way they broke the challenge together. Humans are a low bar to exceed. So next time in Deep Learning, we will talk about class imbalance, a very frequent problem, and how to deal that in your training procedure. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.